Okay, everyone, I think we can get started. Um, welcome to Guilford 250, our first lecture in a year-long series about the history of Guilford County, brought to you by Preservation Greensboro. So first we'll go over just a few little housekeeping tools. Um, just so everybody knows, just in case you haven't had to deal with Zoom for all of 2020, um, everyone is muted and your videos are disabled, um, except for the panelists, which are myself and Benjamin. We cannot hear you or see you, but we most definitely know that you are here. Thank you so much for coming to our first lecture. Um, we're really looking forward to all the, to the rest of the year. Uh, we are recording the webinar, which we will be um, uploading to our YouTube page as well as Facebook. And if you have any technical issues, please utilize the chat function um, and we will do our best to help you. Um, also, for those of you who are unaware of who Preservation Greensboro is, we are um, a local nonprofit, or we're the only non-governmental membership organization focused on architectural history um, in Guilford County. We um, are membership based and we are really excited to bring to you the architectural history of Guilford County. Um, so just in case we need a little refresher, the chat function is to talk to each other and have conversations, make comments to each other. You could do that to the, to the entire group, or you can just have one-on-one -on -one conversations with somebody else who is here. The Q&A is, we ask specifically for questions for Benjamin and I. Um, the hosts and myself and Benjamin will moderate this throughout the presentation tonight, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we possibly can. And I will stop sharing and pass it over to Benjamin. Great. Hi, everybody. It's an um, interesting time to be here. Um, I'm going to switch over. Hopefully, you can all see that. So uh, again, my name is Benjamin Briggs, um, Executive Director of Preservation Greensboro, and our mission, as Catherine referenced, is saving Greensboro's treasured places. Um, we do uh, look at all of Guilford County, really. Uh, how can you not? We have such an amazing uh, selection of architecture uh, in our county, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, a little bit tonight. I endeavor to keep this to one, uh, one hour in length. Um, so just to start out, um, our uh, uh, sort of heroes for Guilford County, and it sort of um, uh, sets the table for the activism that we enjoy in our, in our community. We have one of the uh, keynote uh, first ladies of our nation's history in Dolly Madison, who was born here um, as a Quaker in Guilford County. Uh, John Motley Moorhead, a progressive governor in the uh, mid-19th uh, century who uh, sought to improve transportation, education, um, and uh, industry in our, in our state. And of course, the Greensboro Four, Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, Ezel Blair Jr., who changed his name to Jabril Kazan, and David Richmond, who were uh, the four young men who began uh, America's um, civil rights movement uh, through the sit peaceful sit-ins at uh, Woolworth. Um, so where did Guilford County start? Um, this is a map that uh, it's turned sideways. Um, and if you can see my cursor, North Carolina is oriented east and west of Cape Hatteras uh, on the eastern side and the Appalachian Mountains on the west. And so um, you can see there's a reference in the middle of this map that says uh, desert. Uh, and that's really the, uh, the sand hills, uh, Pinehurst. And if you've ever been in Pinehurst in the summertime, it feels like a desert. And so Guilford is not in, in that area, but we're kind of right in this uh, area that's sort of denoted with uh, grass and trees. And early explorer John Lawson described the land that would become Guilford County in 17, 1701 by saying, quote, all the pine trees were vanished for we had seen none for two days. We passed through a delicate, rich soil this day, no great hills, but pretty risings and levels, which made a beautiful country. We likewise passed over three rivers, um, 
we were taken much taken with the fertility and pleasantness of the neck of land between these uh, branches of rivers and no less pleased that we had uh, passed the river which uh, used to frighten passengers from fording it. In other words, it was sort of a rapids um, at that time. So that's where we sort of started was, was recognizing that we had a pleasant land. Um, and it looked much like this even when early settlers arrived. The land on which Guilford County would be formed is rolling. It varies in elevation from 600 feet uh, from sea level. That's approximately a 60 story building in Manhattan. Uh, to the eastern part of the county to 1,000 feet in the west. That would be uh, the height of a 100-story building in Manhattan. Uh, the future county was divided between Orange in the east and Rowan to the west. Early historians believed that this area was a vast hunting ground for the first people, uh, and they periodically stalked their prey unencumbered by heavy brush. Uh, to keep the brush clear, it was burned off on occasion with controlled burns. The presence of buffalo inspired the use of the name in describing Buffalo Creek. At the time of contact, uh, three small nations of first people lived in close proximity in and around what we call Guilford County, the Tutelo, the Saponi, and the Kiwi. They were a Siouan agricultural people it engaged in hunting, gathering, and cultivation. Uh, there is thought to have been an imbalance of power around 1711, likely due to European contract and the introduction of fatal diseases uh, that caused these people to diminish. Only a few families remained in the vicinity of present-day North Greensboro when Quakers began to arrive in the 1740s. In 1764, a committee was appointed by Quakers from New Garden Friends Meeting to investigate any claims by Native people against the Quakers related to property ownership. But by that time, the native presence was gone and the matter was dropped. The area was soon settled by migrations from two routes. The great trading path from Petersburg to the Catawba Nation provided early access to the region from the Tidewater. And that would be represented by uh, the, the red arrow here to the uh, right-hand side. And you can see this long road that comes down to the Catawba Nation, which is near uh, Charlotte. Um, it was thought that along this road, many early German settlers found land in eastern parts of the county. And then the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road provided access from the Great Valley of Virginia. And along this road traveled thousands of Quakers and Scotch-Irish from Pennsylvania. It is thought up to 60,000 people migrated south to North Carolina during the late 18th century. So that would be represented by this arrow on the left-hand side coming down the Wagon Road through the Valley of Virginia and into uh, the Piedmont of North Carolina. So in those two resp respects, Greensboro really is the southernmost suburb of Philadelphia. The first group of organized settlers was associated with Frieden's Lutheran Church, which was organized in 1745. These were not the Moravians of Salem. These predated Salem. In 1787, a Lutheran missionary wrote about these people saying, the German settlement in Eastern Guilford County lies about 70 miles north of Salisbury and is 28 miles long and 18 miles wide. Many hundreds of families live here close together. For many years, they have been without a preacher, exposed to roaming fanatics who are in some places have already found a considerable following among the ignorant. There are four evangelical churches here, which for some years have been standing vacant and, de and deserted. Still occasionally, they are filled by the shallow noise of an untutored fanatic for whom it is an easy matter through noise and of violent words to engage the imagination of his audience. It is high time these poor congregations among whom still are found who sincerely long for the gospel would receive help if they are not to degenerate completely into a state of heathendom. So that's referencing the isolated nature of the Piedmont of North Carolina. Along with the German settlers in the eastern part of the county, Quakers came to this area in the 1750s from Philadelphia, including Chester County, the Nottingham Settlement on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Later waves of Quakers came from Nantucket, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and even Charleston. They gave their new communities old names, such as Spring Garden and New Garden, pictured here, Springfield and Dover. Quakers had a different outlook on humanity than traditional folks did by understanding that there's that of God in every person. They struggled to find equality among all people, young and old, men and women, black and white, Christian and non-Christian, 
Education was key to enhancing the light of God in all people, and schools were found throughout their territory. Early travelers remarked about the high level of literacy found in this neck of the woods. It was the Quakers who provided the country with its, the nation's fourth first lady, Dolly Madison. It was also Quakers that began Greensboro's love affair with education and a struggle to define and understand human rights. The colonial records of Orange and Rowan counties provided the first known mention of black people, 50 in the former, 54 in the latter counties in 1754. Beginning around 1774, Quaker, uh, Guilford County Quakers began to free the people they enslaved and started an abolitionist movement. In the 1790 census, uh, it shows that Guilford had about 616 enslaved and 27 free black people, roughly 10% of the total population. It is thought that Scotch-Irish settlers were quickest among religious groups in the county to adopt an economic system based on enslavement, though examples do exist of Quaker and German settlers enslaving people well into the 19th century. There has long been an understanding that freedmen migrated to Guilford County because of the liberal attitude of Quakers, growing in number from 100 in 1800 to almost 700 by 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. Primarily from the Philadelphia region, Presbyterian settlers arrived as a body known as the Nottingham Company, which organized agents to purchase large quantities of land around what is today Greensboro on the waters of the branches of the Buffalo and Reedy Fork Creeks. Two churches were formed. The first was Buffalo around 1756. The second was Alamance in 1764. Unlike Quakers, Presbyterians could hold public offices and they did. Several members of the congregation of Buffalo Church were merchants and contributed to the development of a fiscal structure to support expanding agricultural opportunities. Their farms and plantations remain modest log structures with a rare brick building. Quakers built for the long term, Presbyterians only built what was necessary for the time. As the backcountry was populated, administration of government was often corrupt, much to the consternation of settlers who often had stronger ties to Philadelphia than to Eastern North Carolina. These settlers sought to regulate matters themselves by self-determining their rights. These regulators, as they became known, included a large number of residents from Northeastern Rowan County and Western Orange counties, a kerfuffle with Governor William Tryon over taxes, uh, which were up this, seen up this way as a mechanism to fund a crazy fancy palace in New Bern, was known as the Battle of Alamance in 1771. Pictured here is Loyalist Edmund Fanning on the far bank of the Eno uh, River in Hillsborough with a bottle of rum in one hand and wine in the other, working to soothe the rebel rouser farmers. Guilford County was formed in 1771, just a few months before the Battle of Alamance, as a way to pacify and or dilute the growing resistance of the regulators. The county was named for Francis North, Earl of Guilford, father of the Prime Minister of England, who served the time at the time of the country's creation. Guilford had three, has three sister counties established at the same time. They are Wake, Surrey, and Chatham counties. With the establishment of Guilford County, no location nor funding existed for an administrative courthouse. So the old Bowie's Ordinary on the banks of the Deep River in the far western part of the county and now North High Point was selected for the use, uh, for use as a temporary courthouse. The central portion of this structure remains standing, standing today. This was a significant building for the time. Early, early settlers remarked by 1771, there was not a plank floor, a feather bed, a riding carriage, nor a, a side saddle within the bounds of their acquaintance, meaning their friends. The site for the, fir the first county seat was selected more or less by a man named Alexander Martin, a New Jersey native and a Princeton graduate, meaning a lawyer, around 1774 on land he happened to own. Imagine that. Later, he served a single term as governor in 1782 to 1784 and a single term as a U.S. Senator. This was literally called Guilford Courthouse until 1785 when the village was platted very close to the courthouse. The village name was Martinville, named after Alexander Martin, without an S, uh, though it never grew to substantial size. Here it is pictured uh, in 1849, many years after it was abandoned. 
Guilford County and its courthouse were the focus of the American Revolution in March of 1781. Deep River Meeting, Bruce's Crossroads, Dr. Caldwell's School, and New Garden Meeting House were all flashpoints uh, for the, of the war that would be studied for generations. The British Army, under the direction of General Cornwallis, won the battle, but the Pyrrhic victory helped General Nathaniel Green in later battles on the way to Yorktown. Cornwallis, surprisingly, sports several place names in and about Greensboro, such as Cornwallis Road, but General Green uh, would be the namesake of our city, of our county seat. Guilford County is remarkable in having wonderful stories and small monuments all over our county that commemorate important chapters of history. And I want to share with you the story of the Bugler Boy. So the story of the Bugler Boy is, upon hearing that Lord Cornwallis and his troops were nearby, Charles Bruce, who lived up near Summerfield, and two other friends raced to investigate where Lord, Lord Con Cornwallis was. And James Gillis, a 15-year-old bugler for the Patriots, loaned his fast horse to one of the older men to locate the British. The young soldier was standing on the side of the road in a curve between Summerfield and Oak Ridge that still remains today. He was found by the British and slaughtered right there on the side of the road by British troops on February 12th, 1781. The death of the Bugler Boy became one of the best known stories in the American Revolution uh, in Guilford County. And today on Highway 150, you can see uh, the Bugler Boy Monument today and it's very well tended and uh, we're grateful for that. So after the, the Revolutionary War, citizens of Guilford County set about rebuilding their losses. They raised livestock of hogs and cattle, cultivated wheat and corn and hay by slashing and burning the woodlands. General Green commented that so much of the country was still wilderness at the time of the Revolution. On, in June of 1791, George Washington paid a visit to explore the Guilford Battleground, a place he recognized as a turning point in the war. He spent the night in the home of Alexander Martin. He wrote in the diary, on my way, I examined the ground on which the action between General Green and Lord Cornwallis commenced, and after dinner rode over uh, that where the lines were formed and the scene closed and the retreat of the American forces. So this is a Price Strother map, we call it the, the, after the makers of the map of 1808, showing the boundaries of the county, which we recognize today. And you see right near the middle, but a little bit to the north is Martinville without an S. Uh, and that's where the battleground is uh, today. You see other names that are familiar, including Deep River, uh, Center Meeting House to the south, uh, Alamance Church of Presbyterians in the east, and to the uh, north we have the Scott House, which is still standing today, um, and High, High Rock uh, Ford crossing the Haw River in the northeastern part of the county. So buildings of the period were simple, and the best examples remaining are made of brick. Uh, the Haley House to the far uh, left, built in 1786, in the middle of the Richard Mendenhall House in Jamestown, built 1811, and the Jamestown Indulged Meeting House of 1820 on the, uh, on the right hand side. Uh, you see common characteristics here of Flemish bond brickwork on many of the houses like the Haley House, uh, segmental arched windows over the top. As I said earlier, the Quakers built for uh, posterity. They wanted something that was um, gonna permanent and lasting and these are the types of buildings that they built. Um, the Germans were also quite crafty. Uh, the Summers House, uh, on the left-hand side, built about 1780. Look at the diaper pattern in the brick and the gable uh, is very unusual and um, unusual Flemish bond brickwork on that facade as well. And then in 1819, the Summers Tavern was built here on the, on the right-hand side with a beautifully crafted stone chimney, which still exists today, and a double-tiered porch and a wonderful little uh, entryway into the crawl space where they kept uh, cool uh, foods like jellies and jams and, and, um, and jarred material for their, uh, for their pantry. The Presbyterians uh, built in a tidy manner. These are two examples that remain today. The West House on the left-hand side built um, probably as early as the 1790s, still stands in the northern part of the city and off of the West Trail. Um, um, and the McNary House 
uh, here on the right is stands on the grounds of the Greensboro History Museum. You see a similarity of scale of both of these, the chimneys on either side of the, each of the roof lines, uh, high pitched steep roof, um, and then double, uh, double windows um, on two different uh, stories. So the West House especially was an unusually fine building and that was really meant to make a statement that uh, the Presbyterians were here to stay. This map is coded to religious congregations. The green stars on the left-hand side are the location of Quaker meeting houses, Dover, New Garden, Deep River, uh, Jamestown, Springfield and Center and Rehoboth meeting. You see how they're all sort of focused on the Western part of the county. The two central red stars indicate primary Presbyterian churches, including Buffalo and Alamance Presbyterian. And then three purple stars on the extreme right indicate German and Lutheran churches. You see them very close to the Alamance County line. So this sort of shows you how the Quakers were in the West, the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians in the middle, and the German Reformed in the East. Uh, it makes us in inclusive of many different populations uh, in the county. And of course, African-American people lived all over the county. We're not segregated to any one area. So for industry at that time, uh, primarily uh, cottage industry, uh, we still have the old mill at Guilford, also called Bales Old Mill, um, uh, off of uh, NC-68. Uh, still operates as a grist mill. You can still buy some wonderful cornmeal and they have the best sweet potato flour for little muffins uh, that you'll ever find anywhere. But it still functions today on its original uh, massive stone foundations built to survive floods um, on, on this uh, in, near the Oak Ridge area just north of the, of the, rail, of the uh, airport. The first community in, in Guilford County is very proud. It's Jamestown. They like to brag that it's uh, older than its neighbors, Greensboro to the north and High Point to its south. Uh, Old Jamestown was a community center for uh, Quakers. It was established as early as 1752 by members of the Mendenhall family, but it was finally platted in 1812. Um, and many of the houses began to be built at that time. And we have a smattering, the Mendenhall Counting House was actually the leather shop for the Moorhead, for the, sorry, the Mendenhall family. Uh, the Coffin House is one of the best examples of Greek revival architecture with a wonderful temple form around the front door. And the Madison Lindsay House, um, very simple vernacular style house that was, uh, sits today on the grounds of Mendenhall Home Place. But Greensboro wasn't far behind. Not all of residents uh, were at peace with Martinville as the county seat because, as you remember, it was not central and it disadvantaged residents to the south and to the east. Those residents lobbied to reposition Old Guilford's courthouse uh, to a new central location. Surveyors easily identified the geographic center of our rectangular county but found the location uh, in the midst of a marshy valley unfit for use as a town site. Today we know that valley is Fisher Park. So 42 acres of land on high ground along the Martinville to Fayetteville stage road were purchased for $2.33 an acre and three streets north, south and, and three streets east, west were created. The settlement was named in honor of our hero of Guilford Courthouse, General Nathaniel Green and took the title as Green's Borough. So this is an image of uh, Greensboro on, a, on an early, earliest map that we have. And the red line here intersecting from north to south uh, is a, a, my supposition of where the old uh, Martinville to the north, the Fayetteville Road to the south went. And it's very interesting that if you line up Martin Luther King uh, to the south and you line that up to Battleground Avenue to the north and it ends right there, that the line is almost continuous. So it's my thinking that this, this old road might have just crossed diagonally through Greensboro. And then once the city watches, I switch it to when the city was laid out, they simply straightened that road. And uh, so it ca caused a little dip here on Battleground and they matched that dip on one side to Yanceyville Street, which went to Yanceyville and Milton on the Dan River, which was a major port for Greensboro. On the south side, they reoriented uh, what was known then as Ash Old Ashboro Street, which is today MLK, and Mevin Road here to the to the west and made those uh, sort of sideways uh, diagonal streets. And there were there's a primary building on the south side that was a, a male school and there was a primary house on the north side, which was the Lindsay House. So if you stood in Courthouse Square with the courthouse in the middle of the street and looked north, you'd see the facade of this house. If you stood in the square and looked south, you'd see the, the building that was located here. 
And then this road running diagonally past Blandwood was the old Salisbury Road. And that was the road that cut down and became High Point Road, went to Jamestown through Northern High Point as Lexington Avenue and on to Lexington. So there, there's the lines. You can see how you got to different places. Market Street led to Guilford College, Virginia to the north, Milton, the port city, uh, and Raleigh, Durham off to the east, and Chapel Hill and, and Ashboro to the south. Um, so uh, a transportation system was born with three streets north-south, three streets east-west. Today, the north-south streets are uh, Green, Davie, and Elm, and the east-west are Sycamore, also known as February One Place, uh, Market Street and uh, uh, Gaston, which has been renamed to uh, Friendly. So uh, during this time in the in the mid 19th century, um, we did have uh, plantations in Guilford County, but we the, the narrative for Guilford County for generations has been that the enslaved population here was modest compared to wealthy counties to the east, such as Caswell and Warren and Halifax. Largely, that observation remains true and sound today, recognizing that a modest population of enslaved people was here alongside a modest population of freed people. Large plantations were rare in Guilford County, um, best exemplified uh, in the upper corner here by the uh, Parker House uh, near Brown Summit. Uh, and then a small cabin to the rear of that is recognized uh, likely as a slave uh, quarters, enslaved quarters to the rear. Other housing though in the area was modest and we see the Paisley house here uh, in the upper corner and the lower corner, a very simple frame farmhouse. These would be high-end houses for that period of time uh, for, for, Quaker, uh, uh, for Quaker Presbyterian and, and German Reformed uh, Lutheran settlers. As the western part of Guilford County was populated by Quakers who regarded freeing of enslaved uh, as their own peculiar mission, the Underground Railroad had a strong presence here. In the, their yearly meeting in 1774, the Quakers proclaimed the need to free enslaved people. In the first decade of the 19th century, a society was organized in Guilford called the Manumission Society of North Carolina. Its missions, its meetings were held in the Deep River section, but others uh, besides friends were members, including slaveholders. The society sought an end to the slave trade by proclaiming no more enslaved people could be brought into the state. With help from their representative, John Motley Moorhead, they sought laws to be passed that fostered freedom among African Americans, but most of those bills failed by vote in Raleigh. The Underground Railroad was an outgrowth of the Manumission Society, but not connected to it. It was a secret organization by which enslaved people were sent northwest to cross the Ohio River. The scheme remained a secret for 25 years, during which time many local slaveholders saw their populations decrease. The first depot of this railroad branch was in southwest Guilford County around High Point. Um, and so uh, we do have a, a proud history and I want to to recognize that the railroad was not a railroad with, with tracks and rails, but it was more of a system of, of hiding places. And a picture of this uh, stream bed in the, in the snow reveals that there uh, were caves and hideaways that could be uh, made that you could, could hide someone uh, along a stream bank. Maybe somebody would sleep there during the day, a uh, sympathetic person would bring out food, uh, try to care for them and point them in the right direction to the next safe place for them to hide where they would make their way overnight uh, before daylight the next day. The first industrialist to bring steam power to the upper Piedmont is recognized as Greensboro resident hum Henry Humphreys. Humphrey was a Presbyterian merchant who liquidated a stock uh, to uh, finance a modern cotton mill, thus inspiring a generation of industrialists from Salem to Alamance and Mo John Motley Moorhead in, in Rockingham County. Um, just blocks from the courthouse, this was likely North Carolina's first purpose-built, uh, completely integrated bale-to-bolt cotton mill uh, with machinery delivered at great effort from New Jersey-based Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosner. Um, it's one of the earliest American textile machinery uh, manufacturers. Um, this was the first steam power mill in the county and perhaps the first in Western North Carolina. And this really began Greensboro's legacy as a textile center. We also had gold in North Carolina. Gold was discovered in Cabarrus County in 1799 and, uh, and uh, exploration uh, was made all the way up to Guilford County. Uh, there was uh, what was called a Cabarrus vein extends through Rowan, Davidson, uh, Randolph uh, to Jamestown and Sedgefield today. 
Um, several mines were operated in Guilford, including Gardner Hill Mine, the Lindsay Mine, uh, North State McCullough being the most famous. Uh, the state granted the first charter to a gold mining company in 1827, and the U.S. Mint opened in Charlotte in 1837. By 1849, many miners had headed to Georgia for their gold rush uh, or to California. And so the imposing uh, uh, stone mill house uh, that we all recognize in McCullough's gold mill was uh, influenced by the tin mines of the Cornwall in, in far the toe, uh, far southwestern toe of England. Uh, it looks like that. And the mill was represents the difficulty in extracting gold from native milk quartz. You all know milk quartz is that very hard substance. And in this mill, they would mill that milk quartz to get the, uh, the gold out of it. And it was a, a castle because they had to secure it and they had a drawbridge and everything uh, to keep uh, robbers from stealing it uh, before uh, shipping it to the U.S. Mint in Charlotte. We do have a handful of surviving mid-century uh, housing uh, in downtown Greensboro and around the county. Uh, we have the, the Paisley House in the upper corner to start on the upper left-hand corner. Um, uh, built maybe in 1820, and it might have been, it, rumor, old rumors saying that that was the original uh, new courthouse built in, in Greensboro in, in the eight, early 1800s, but that's, we'd need some dendrochronology to figure that out. It still stands in the Westerwood neighborhood on Hillcrest. Um, we also have the, Troy, the Bumpus Troy House uh, with the columns on the front in the center. Uh, we have the Walker Scarborough House of 1850, on uh, the lower uh, left-hand side, uh, we have um, uh, the Elihu Menonal House, which is uh, in the center on the bottom, which is a Quaker home that's being threatened with a shopping center at the moment. So we have a wonderful array uh, of houses from that period that remains. And this is a, you know, this is a joy that we have in Greensboro and Guilford County that Charlotte doesn't have. Charlotte just doesn't have those grand old houses in their downtown anymore. By the 1840s, Greensboro had evolved into an administrative county seat with merchants, a factory, gold miners, number of educational situations. Its hometown hero, then Governor John Motley Moorhead, literally put the village on the North Carolina map by commissioning New York architect Alexander Jackson Davis to erect a handsome Tuscan villa on the edge of town. When completed in 1846, Moorhead proved to the world that North Carolina was not such a veil of humility between two mountains of conceit that we could be just as conceited as New Yorkers. Um, so Blandwood, of course, is owned by Preservation Greensboro and remains uh, uh, opened even during COVID with a, an appointment. Through Moorhead's political and financial leadership, the North Carolina Railroad was formed in 1849, and Moorhead made sure the new road touched his home place, Blandwood, to assure that Greensboro would sit on the main rail trunk line and not in, uh, through Ashboro as had previously been proposed. As you can see in the center of the map, uh, the curve name, uh, let's see, curve name here, John Motley Moorhead. This is Blandwood's property here. This is, this is the oldest map of Greensboro. This is Elm Street called South Street at the time. This is the mail school that was at the terminus of Elm Street. So you see that uh, literally the train tracks past the lower 10 feet of John Motley Moorhead's property. Uh, hit other land here, he owns land over here too, but how good to be the governor, and that is why Greensboro has the railroad and not Ashboro. The courthouse of Guilford County was uh, reconstructed in 1856. Uh, the, the, the railroad brought new people and inspired Greensboro to prepare itself for a new era. Uh, the UGH, U-G-H, was dropped from the name officially in 1851. Um, and uh, in the newspaper, it was stated that the new courthouse was built after an elegant design in the Roman Corinthian style, a brick stucco with a graceful wooden tower. It is an elegant and inspiring edifice credited to the taste of the county authorities and to the liber liberality of the taxpayers. It's hard for me to say, liberality of the taxpayers. So uh, with the railroad, which is the blue line that's cutting through the, our, our familiar map, Greensboro found itself as in an advantageous position uh, for uh, manufacturing, trade, and commerce. To quote the newspaper again, it is a date we are particular about because it marks a new era and new annals of our place. Um, so they, there was a great celebration with the railroad, and that really began Greensboro's march towards prosperity. Of course, the Civil War uh, stifled that. 
In 1861, Greensboro, Guilford County was not real excited about secession, casting 2,771 votes against secession as opposed to only 113 in favor of secession. Greensboro, great, Greensboro's greatest role in the Civil War is ending it. Under some reports, Greensboro is the location of the last cabinet meeting of the Confederate government. Governor Zebulon Vance moved the state capital here in advance of General Sherman, but surrendered the state uh, with mediation provided through Governor Moorhead in the West Parlor of Blandwood. At the end of the war, Guilford County played several roles in Reconstruction. In 1867, the Baltimore Association of Friends to advise and assist friends in Southern states. How's that for a name? Constructed a farm to provide new agricultural technology to farmers in the state that were suffering from the Civil War. During the 1870s and 1880s, the model farm attracted a great deal of attention for its progressiveness and innovative agricultural practices. It was so successful that Governor Jonathan Worth proclaimed the farm as the only green spot in the Carolinas. Uh, Ohio attorney Albion Turgi moved to Greensboro to work uh, with area Republicans uh, to rebuild the New South as a superior court judge, but he was sent packing to New York, a big image of him as courtesy of Sidney Porter slash O. Henry. And finally, Quaker Yardley Warner established Warnersville on the southern edge of Greensboro as a community where African Americans could own their own homes, build their own churches, own land, run their own businesses, and educate their own children. And Warnersville is still celebrated today. High Point was established on the highest point on the main trunk of the North Carolina Railroad. The rail line was completed in 1856 and connected uh, Goldsboro in the east to Charlotte in the west. Um, the point of High Point is about 900 feet above sea level, the highest uh, on the entire line between those cities. Uh, the surveyor, Captain Gregg, when he arrived in this location, said to his surveying team, boys, this is the highest point along the entire line, so we will drive a stake here and call it High Point. It was founded in 1859 and the village grew rapidly during Reconstruction as a manufacturing center run primarily by Quakers and Northern industrialists. Here we have a map of Greensboro in the late 19th century that was divided after Reconstruction into townships. You see Moorhead Township, High Point Township, Rock Creek, Oak Ridge, uh, Center Grove. So all the township was done at that time, designations were done at that time, uh, but it begins to sort of set the course for uh, modern uh, Guilford County as we know it today. And many little towns, wonderful towns are founded throughout our county. And I think perhaps more than any other county in the Piedmont, we have these charming places such as Summerfield established as early as 1812 with its modest little downtown. Stokesdale, which was built as a small commercial and uh, manufacturing center in the far northwestern part with its very handsome storefronts and water tower. Uh, Julian to the south, a very early uh, community, 1790. Oak Ridge, uh, established as a military academy as early as 1852, but established and incorporated as a town in 1897, which was the same year that Witsit was created around the Witsit Institute. This is what the little village of Witsit looked like had an educational facility there. And then Gibsonville established along the North Carolina Railroad as a manufacturing center uh, on, right on the Alamance County line. Guilford Courthouse National Military Park was created um, in 1887. Uh, it was one of the earliest acts of historic preservation in the state of North Carolina. Uh, by 1917, legislating, le legislation creating the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park was approved, and in 1933, the park was transferred to the Department of the Interior to be administered as by the National Park Service. Architecture took new forms based on nationally popular styles during the late 19th century. Some of our Yankee-style Gothic houses across the, the top might, might have been designed by, Lewis, uh, by Lyndon Swain. Knoxville architect George Barber did design at least one house in the city that was, is no longer standing. Um, and then the, the uh, red house uh, here in the lower side was uh, designed by Orlo Epps, a native of Indiana who practiced in Greensboro in the 1890s. He also designed uh, Faust at UNCG. Uh, so here's Greensboro, 1891. Notice the undeveloped streets in the distance and the horizon. Uh, this was all land owned by the North Carolina Steel and Iron Company. Uh, this was an effort to use local mineral deposits along the deep river to make Greensboro a center for the steel industry, but it never took uh, hold, never took root in the city, but they sure did have broad ambitions uh, for that land, which will come up in a moment. 
During the 1890s, we saw a, a significant increase in education opportunities. Bennett College was founded in 1873, originally co-ed, but by 1926, it became a four-year women's college, and today is one of the two historically black colleges that enroll women only. The 1890 Moral Land Grant Act required that each state show that race was not an admissions criteria for land-grant institutions. So out of that, North Carolina State University was established for white men in Raleigh, and NCANT was established for black men here in Greensboro. Today, it is the largest HBCU in the nation. And then finally, UNCG was established as a women's college by legislative enactment in 1891 as the state normal and industrial school. The school provided an, uh, instruction in business, domestic science, and teaching. It is the first and only public university in North Carolina founded for the purpose of educating women. Now, the Cone brothers uh, opened what might be the most important uh, business decision made in, in Guilford County. And uh, perhaps the Cones, who were Jewish, were attracted by the progressiveness of the city, maybe by the friendly Quaker spirit of Greensboro. Um, but they arrived in the city in 1890. Um, they bought the land of the failed North Carolina Steel and Iron Company with all those undeveloped streets in the map that we saw. Um, and uh, they, they began an odyssey of, of development. Uh, city leader J.A. O'Dell was said to have remarked, grab hold of their coattails, boys, and don't let them get away of the Cone Brothers. Uh, they began building off uh, the proximity of the field, cotton field, to the, the mill, and their first factory in 1895 was named Proximity Cotton Mill to reflect that relationship. Their second factory they reckoned would be a revelation to the industry, and so it was given the name Revela Revelation Mill, but they were a little worried that their Christian friends might think that that was a biblical reference and that might cause offense, so they changed Revelation Mill to Revolution Mill. And that still operates today, not, the, not as a mill, but as a multi-use uh, complex in Northeast Greensboro with uh, thousands of apartments and businesses, small businesses. The, the Cone Mill is emblematic of the prosperity of the 1890s that, that led to remarkable buildings, the sanctuary for the Presbyterian Church um, on the, uh, uh, and, and the West Market Methodist Church uh, done in the 1890s. Uh, by out-of-state uh, architects, uh, Market Street by uh, Pennsylvania, Newcastle, Pennsylvania architect and the Presbyterian ch uh, Church um, uh, by uh, an architect from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, and then at the bottom is the High Point Graded School. Uh, that was designed by a Charlotte architect uh, completed in 1897. His name was Hook. So you can see we began to get a lot of money. You see the scale of our buildings is getting grander and grander. That prosperity was not limited to textile industry in Greensboro. Uh, with High Point uh, came High Point uh, furniture industry and the manufacturers of affordable and medium grade furnishings uh, led a parade of announcements uh, from furniture companies through the 1890s. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, High Point contained 33 factories and was well positioned to secure its place as the furniture capital of the world. That began in the 1890s. Today, we think of High Point as the furniture capital, and that is true. In the 1890s, saw that massive e expansion of furniture. Um, and in eight, 1909, the city held its first trade show, uh, the first in the southern market, the, the furniture market. However, the real wealth in High Point came from textiles, uh, socks to be exact. Um, perhaps the greatest contribution uh, High Point has given to our state is its architectural patrimony of the height of the textile era in that city from 1910 to 1940. So early 20th century architectural housing was eclectic. We're fortunate to have so many examples that are still standing in all of our cities. Styles range from Richardsonian Romanesque in the upper left corner through the late uh, Queen Anne style in the center uh, by uh, Frank Milburn, and then wonderful Queen Anne style houses and even a, a grand shingle style house, which is out near uh, Guilford College. All these remain standing today. With architects such as Orlo Epps, who was the, we saw his red house earlier, it still stands in College Hill, and we are familiar with Faust Hall at UNCG, and general contractors such as Jay Kirkpatrick Greensburg began to develop a distinctive style of its own by the 1890s that included buildings with towers and commercial buildings with heavy pressed metal cornices and, uh, and brick with granite trim facades. Uh, the, the train station that still stands today at the foot of Elm Street uh, High Point City Hall, wonderful building with a tower to 
uh, drain and dry the uh, hoses, the water hoses. And even Summerfield had wonderful brickwork um, in one of its uh, country stores. As early as 1883, efforts were underway to hitch a wagon to a road engine to establish a streetcar line. Uh, that was never very successful until 1902 by, when the Greensboro Electric Company was inaugurated to create a permanent electric streetcar system at its peak. Uh, the Greensboro trolley had 24 operating cars and 12 miles of track. East Greensboro and Warnersville were not served by the trolleys. After more than 50 years of service, motor buses replaced the trolley system. The last trolley in Greensboro was retired about 1956. Um, and the outside destination was the Lindley Amusement Park that was at the termination of this long line here. High Point system was initiated in 1910 and discontinued by 1930. The blue line indicate going up towards uh, Irving Park indicates the uh, existence of that original old trolley line. Uh, but you see lines that go out towards the, the Cone properties. We see a line going down MLK. Uh, we see a line going into the Glenwood neighborhood. And we see one going through College Hill past UNCG out to uh, the Lindley uh, uh, Park uh, um, fairground. I'm just showing this picture to show you how the street patterns began to change in Greensboro and High Point from 1900. This is an area of Glenwood that we see today. It's a wonderful grid. It looks like Manhattan. Uh, by uh, 1903 with the Dunleith neighborhood, we are beginning to see just a little bit of a curve placed on these pragmatic square blocks. But by 1903, 1904, when Fisher Park was really platted out, we still see echoes of the grid but we see the insertion of a serpentine road around the park. And so we began to see sort of that suburban ideal of curvy roads and bringing in some natural space through parks into our city. Uh, we also saw a romantic uh, period of architecture, including craftsman architecture. In High Point, we have an amazing Moroccan house, uh, which is one of my favorite. We have an amazing uh, uh, Spanish style house, Mediterranean, a uh, very romantic uh, uh, neoclassical style a hacienda uh, with vigas sticking out of the front of the building of stucco and then in a very Italianate uh, grand house in High Point. Um, so you're sort of picking during this period revival, you, you, you're choosing house styles like you choose your, your, your dress or your costume for a party. Uh, you just sort of pick and choose and wear. Um, Greensboro and North High Point had dedicated park space earlier in their existence. Uh, Greensboro's first park space was really the first urban space in North Car in, in Guilford County, uh, was donated not by an American, by British captain, Basil Fisher. He donated that low land that was seen as unsuitable for a county seat. Remember, there were ducks swimming around here in 1901 and started a tradition in Greensboro of streamside parks, some parks with the stream down the middle, with parkways on either side and selling the beautiful uh, house lots that overlooked the parks. In East Greensboro, the Dr. Sebastian House and the historic L. Richardson Memorial Hospital stand in the Noco Park neighborhood. Dr. Sebastian's Tudor style house um, was built in 1928, just across the street from the 1927 L. Richardson Memorial Hospital. The pair of buildings represents an early chapter in medical arts in North Carolina, especially regarding uh, black history in the state. Recently, awareness has been raised on a collection of significant mid-century modern houses in adjacent neighborhoods of Clinton Hills and Benbow Park that contribute to the storyline of the civil rights era in Greensboro. Noco, of course, named after Jacob Noco, who was an early teacher who was born in Pennsylvania, moved up to Greensboro um, right at the end of the Civil War and taught children here and became a very prominent politician. In High Point, Washington Street got its start, start as early as 1910. It grew in response to Jim Crow laws that ordered separate but uh, separate uh, racial segregation throughout the South. Um, central to the neighborhood was the William Penn High School, established as early as 1893 by uh, New York Quakers uh, who, who uh, sought to give vocational training for black students. Pictured here is now the Penn Griffin School. And then one of those students was John Coltrane who grew up near the school in a fine Dutch colonial home, uh, pictured here, still standing today, owned by his grandfather, Reverend William Blair. Land acquired by uh, farmer Jesse Brown in 1859 was traversed by the Richmond and Danville Railroad in 1863. It was a high spot on that li land uh, line. So the, the little crossing was called Brown Summit. Uh, and it is the namesake for Summit Avenue in Greensboro, which was the road to Brown Summit. 
Uh, Wadsworth uh, Congregational Church was established by Reverend William Madison Lindsay, just south of the Sedalia community in 1870. He was born enslaved in 1833, and he escaped to Canada and later found his way to Massachusetts. There he was employed as the valet for the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Cambridge, who sponsored his attendance to Oberlin College, a Congregationalist school in Ohio. Uh, and so this, uh, he returned to Guilford County and established a Congregationalist Church in Eastern Guilford County that still stands today and is a Guilford County landmark. And I love that church facade. And then finally, the Bright Lodge here in the, and the Hillsdale store are reminiscent of the scale of housing that we see in some of our crossroads communities. Of course, uh, civil rights history was made in, in North Carolina thanks to people like Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Um, honoring, uh, uh, providing a, a school uh, for, uh, for women, for young women. Uh, eventually, young men were invited to attend in the 1960s. Um, Charlotte Hawkins Brown was one of the most capable uh, women in, uh, in North Carolina history. Uh, she had representation up north and supporters that would, were happy to, to extend um, grants to her to keep the facility uh, uh, running and to build new buildings. And often these buildings were named after the donors up in northern states. And it had a reputation really for the, the touchstone for very high-end education, especially for young women um, during the period of the 18, 1920s to the 1960s. We have a variety of communities in the mid 20th century of, in Guilford County. We have lots of mill communities uh, ranging from uh, White Oak Newtown of the Mill family in the upper left hand corner. We have the Highland Mill Village, which was a representative uh, mill, uh, mill community in the southern part of High Point. Uh, we have East White Oak School in eastern northeastern Greensboro that is currently under a fundraising project. It was provided by the Cone family for the children of black workers. And then the western part of the city, we have the Pomona Mill Village. And this is one of our few shotgun houses that remains in the city under uh, rehabilitation um, in the Pomona uh, neighborhood. A lot of that industry led to very grand houses. And these are the scale of houses that are very rare in the Southern United States. But because we are making so much money in High Point and in Greensboro, these were the results. So these sprawling estates include um, the Alfred Scales House in the Ham Hamilton, Hampton, Hampton Lakes area, Hamilton Lakes area of Western Greensboro, designed by an architect named Sayre of Anderson, South Carolina. Hillside Farm in the center here was constructed for the Richardson family in 1929 by an archi a Philadelphia architect named Brognard Oakey, one of my favorite names. And then the last house at the bottom is called Three Musketeers. It was designed by Winston-Salem architect Luther Lashmet. It was completed in 1930 for the Slane family who uh, Slane Hosiery uh, made socks. The same era is uh, replete with wonderful civic buildings um, the wealth of the city uh, resulted in, in a scale of civic buildings that was, is almost unrivaled in North Carolina. The Passenger Depot here at, in Greensboro, 1927, uh, constructed to plans by the, provided by the New York architects of Fellheimer and Wagner. Uh, they are most associated as the lead architect on the Grand, New York Grand Central Terminal and the Cincinnati Union Terminal. Uh, Carolina Theater was uh, erected in, uh, in 1927. The architect was Jules de Sieber of Washington, D.C. Many embassies along Massachusetts Avenue in Washington were designed by him. Uh, Masons built wonderful temple, one of the most remarkable urban uh, city temples uh, uh, for the Masons uh, remaining in North Carolina. And of course, the Crest Building, for those that are Crest aficionados by Edward Siebert, uh, Greensboro is considered one of the most exuberant in the nation with its colored uh, tiles. Really wonderful collection of buildings. And that's not just limited to commercial buildings, but sanctuaries. Um, this, th these uh, scale, these sanctuaries from Our Lady of Grace and uh, uh, in uh, Fisher uh, in uh, Sunset Hills. Um, of course, our synagogue, Temple Emmanuel. Um, uh, and the um, uh, First Presbyterian Churches of High Point down below and the First Presbyterian Church of Greensboro, all these churches on a scale that you just don't see in places like Raleigh uh, and arguably even Durham. We've got a scale of, 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 of wealth with these religious buildings that are just absolutely remarkable for North Carolina. And our government buildings are just right there with them. The Guilford County Courthouse 
uh, built by a committee of architects chaired by Harry Barton, 1917 to 1918. Uh, the High Point Post Office up here on the upper uh, that was designed between uh, 1931, uh, 1933 by uh, High Point uh, star architect Louis Voorhees. Um, and then uh, the wonderful uh, building here by James Wetmore, uh, that's the uh, Richardson Pryor uh, Federal Building on West Market Street today. All the, these uh, two on the right-hand side, fantastic examples of Art Deco. And Greensboro had its skyscrapers too. Um, uh, as banking and insurance grew in the city and the wealth and prosperity, Greensboro and High Point both had wonderful skyscrapers. Uh, Frank Weston designed the Dixie Insurance Building in 1904, one of the earliest skyscrapers in the state. Uh, Raleigh James Hughes designed the American Exchange Bank and Trust Building of 1919 at the corner of, uh, Mar of Market and Elm. The Sh High Point Sheraton Hotel was designed by uh, um, uh, w. L. Stoddard in 1921, New York architect, and uh, and uh, of course the the towering uh, Jefferson Standard Life Insurance Building constructed 1921 by Charles Hartman of Greensboro from New York, who came to build buildings for Stoddard. So there's a connection between many of these buildings, but it's neat to see the skyscrapers of Guilford County rising up higher and higher. Charles Hartman also designed a speculative building that was later occupied by Woolworths in 1960. Of course, the building was the location of the first highly publicized sit-in that led to a movement across the South to end segregation and broaden civil rights. Um, <clears throat> like it did for the American Revolution and the Civil War, Greensboro once again and Guilford County found itself at the center point of a new American era. And in spite of the civil rights movement, Greensboro instituted the first urban renewal program in the state with the intent of ridding the Gate City of vacant and substandard housing. The African-American Warnersville and East Market Street neighborhoods were identified as areas of blight. And in 1965, the city moved to renew the neighborhoods by rebuilding to modern standards. This renewal project was funded by the federal government. It was the first of its kind in North Carolina. Um, High Point also experienced urban renewal. It wasn't as early as Greensboro, but it, the result was that vast areas of African-American neighborhoods, often with modest housing, uh, shotgun houses, uh, many houses that would not have had public services like running water and maybe even not electricity. Um, a lot of it just uh, owner uh, um, uh, income property uh, owned by investors. Uh, but that it was whether it was owned by a property owner and had been in the family for generations and generations and was a point of pride, or whether it was rental property, the whole kit and caboodle was destroyed in South Greensboro and in East uh, Greensboro. That era also saw excitement for mid-century modern architecture. By the 1960s, Greensboro took the spot as the second largest city in the state. And with that position, it ventured into bold new architectural commissions. Of course, we have Walter Gropius's Carolina Container Corporation of 1944, still standing on East Market Street. Ralph Walker, who designed the Elm Street Center, was the president of the American Institute of Architects when he designed the commission for the Myers Department Store of 1949, incredibly modern. Edward Lowenstein, who was a Jewish architect who moved here from uh, Chicago and came uh, for, for love, as his uh, daughter says, uh, commit, built his own residence here, very modern house um, in 1954. And Eduardo Catalano, who was an internationally recognized um, architect who built embassies in South Africa and Argentina, uh, native of Argentina, uh, designed the 1970 uh, uh, governor pl gov governmental plaza in 1970. And finally, in reaction to the urban renewal and in reaction to some of this very grand modern Spartan architecture, uh, there was a beginning of preservation, historic preservation in Greensboro as early as 1887 with the Guilford, Guilford Battleground, as we saw. Um, uh, and the old uh, First Presbyterian Church was donated by Mrs. Lunsford Richardson for use as a civic center uh, and later museum. <clears throat> now today, the Greensboro History Museum in 1937. Uh, High Points Market Square held the title as the largest tax credit project in the state uh, for, for decades when it was started uh, in 1980, roughly. Uh, in Greensboro, we have uh, early historic districts such as College Hill in 1980, the first historic district in, in High Point, the Johnson Street District in 1986, 
um, our local landmarks program that was created in order to uh, recognize individual properties was established in 1984. And today we have 109 landmark designated properties. So all of these uh, are buildings that are, are promoted and, and protected uh, by the voice of historic preservation organizations such as Preservation Greensboro, established in 1966, the High Point Preservation Society, established in 1984. And both are exclusively preservation organizations, not just uh, historic pre uh, history organizations. So that brings us to historic preservation, the end of this, uh, of this talk. Um, I, I want to thank you for helping us to begin celebrating Guilford County's 250th birthday. I'd love for you to circle the date of uh, third Thursday of the month, which will be February 18th. We have a special speaker um, in, uh, from, uh, in Heather Wagner, who's going to come and talk about civil rights era touchstones. This is really a focus on the modern architecture of East Greensboro. It's a study that's currently ongoing. It'll be one hour like this. Um, if you enjoy learning about preservation and enjoy supporting historic preservation in our community, I do hope that you'll be a member at any level that you feel comfortable. Uh, we'd love to have your uh, voice included in ours as we go about the city and promoting uh, uh, a careful consideration and contemplation of historic uh, places. So with that, I'm going to close and I'm going to uh, let Catherine join us and see if there's any final closing words. We do have three questions in the Q&A section, Benjamin, if you okay. have to answer those. The first one I'll get you started is, what is slash was? <laughs> buoys. Yes. So, yeah, that's a good question. So buoys uh, was a Dutchman. And uh, sometimes it's buoys, but sometimes buoys. And uh, he was one of the first settlers in Guilford County. Often the Dutch were the first to come into the area because they were trappers. Um, but he uh, was one of the earliest property owners coming here, we think, in the 1740s. So, uh, and he, uh, in that location, he had a, a tavern. But we didn't call them taverns in the South. We called taverns ordinaries. Why it's called an ordinary, I don't know. But uh, so Bowie's Ordinary was where the first courthouse was. And Valerie had a little bit of a, uh, asked a little bit of history about the Greensboro uh, Museum of History building. So it was First Presbyterian Church. Um, it was never a private home, but it was the, the ancestral home. You know, as I've said, the, the Presbyterians were sort of the, the kings around here. They were the ones with the wealth and the politics like John Motley Moorhead and many, many others. Um, and that was their sanctuary. And they remained there until 1928 when that site was deemed too small, too modest for their grand new sanctuary, which was built in Fisher Park. Um, so the, the old sanctuary was, uh, was sold to the city for use as a civic center. And that evolved from meeting spaces to a museum by the 1930s, 1940s. So that's why it was the ancestral home of the, of the, uh, the Presbyterians here. And uh, one more question. The, uh, the Carnegie uh, Library on Market Street in Greensboro is torn down. You know, uh, uh, we do have two others in other campuses. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in Charlotte, and he described Charlotte in the best ways I've ever, best way I've ever heard. He says, Charlotte is a city that's in love with the future. And Greensboro aspired to be that uh, for many, many years. It fell in love with the future, and it was, it was following the footsteps of Charlotte meaning that it was really sacrificing its past and its history to uh, open up opportunities for the future. And during that era of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, there was a, a bit of a, of a rush to uh, destroy the old and start the New South. The New South was one built on modernism, it was built on uh, equal rights, it was built on economy, and it was casting the old, uh, the old South aside. And during that time, incredible architecture was destroyed in Greensboro. And if we all, uh, if you, any of you remember that, your heart will break remembering some of the amazing houses and architecture and skyscrapers and churches that were destroyed during that period of time. But I'm glad, I'm, I, I'd like to think that recently we've turned the corner and we're more of a preservation conscious community. We've got so much preservation going on. We've really turned that around in the city. And I'm proud of Greensboro being a considerate place where at least historic buildings are given a, a chance many times. 
And one more question, the story of individual architects and possible rivalries and collaboration is a great story to be told. I, example, I, I agree with you. There are so many rivalries um, and there's so many to, there are more than you can even mention, but um, uh, uh, there, there's, it, the whole book could be written and not just Greensboro architects, but there, Ralph Walker, who designed the, uh, the department store on Elm Street was a great rival to the architect of the prior uh, federal building. And they nipped at each other all the time. So not only did you have rivalries in Greensboro architect, you had rivalries on the, on the national level that were, were playing out here as well. So I hope if nothing else that you recognize that you live in a county with a remarkable history and a remarkable past and it's something worth celebrating and talking about. And I hope that we can do that over the next year as we celebrate 250 years. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, we will end the webinar here uh, and the webinar will be loaded on our YouTube and Facebook page if you would like to rewatch it. Thanks everybody. Thank you, have a good night.